Hey, everybody, from a nightclub and a sweat lodge at the end of the end of the world, this is uh, Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth. Uh, it is uh, Sunday, the 17th of March, 2013. I would say St. Patty's Day, but pagans don't really like St. Patty too much. He, uh, he uh, had a habit of trying to kill <laughs> Everybody who believed that Mother Earth was sacred and alive. Uh, but that's okay. You can wear green if you want to, and I certainly uh, say hello to all my Irish friends out there. All right, so uh, busy night, big show. When I heard today from Graham Hancock uh, that he was available to be on the show tonight, uh, I was overwhelmed and ecstatic. Um, and I spent uh, a lot of time, I was so aware that there are so many important things about which we must talk tonight in this brief time that we have that I, I started working on an introduction and, and, and after a while I just gave up. And uh, I was given inspiration uh, for how to approach the show tonight uh, with this quote, uh, which is from Crazy Horse, who fought against uh, General George Armstrong Custer, the Battle of the Little Bighorn. In 1877, uh, Crazy Horse said, Upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again, and it shall be a blessing for a sick world, a world filled with broken promises, selfishness, and separation, a world longing for light again. I can see a time of seven generations when all the colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life, and the whole earth will become one circle again. In that day, there will be those among the Lakota who will carry knowledge and understanding of unity among all living things, and the young white ones will come to those of my people and ask for this wisdom. I salute the light within your eyes where the whole universe dwells, for when you are at the center within you and I am at that place within me, we shall be as one. Crazy horse. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, it's a special show for a lot of reasons because of the state of consciousness that we bring to it tonight. And I am, I am kind of approaching this show tonight from the standpoint that Graham Hancock and I are sharing the same consciousness, and therefore very little work is going to be necessary. I am going to have to introduce him to set this up so that we can make best use of our time. Very quickly, Charles Eisenstein, author of Sacred Economics, has been a guest on this show twice, will be our guest two weeks from tonight, just before he does a three-day appearance in Boulder, Colorado, in mid-April, uh, which I will be attending. Charles Eisenstein is an amazing light and a, and a, a, a new leader uh, in this consciousness, and uh, the bears are coming out of their caves. Tonight, uh, as we sit down to have this discussion with, with uh, Graham Hancock, uh, European banks are on the edge, uh, on the verge of a major evolution, because in Cyprus, it has been announced that the, Cy the Cyprus government will take 10% out of everybody's bank accounts effective tomorrow to pay for austerity, to pay the banks. They will be going into checking and savings accounts, taking 10%. Now, ask yourself, <clears throat> what would happen if 10% of whatever you've got in your checking account disappeared overnight, and how many bad check fees would you have, and what would fall through? Well, that's what's happening in Cyprus. The world's having a breakdown, whether you look at Fukushima, whether you look at climate change, whether you look at any of a thousand, uh, how about 12,000 uh, dead pigs floating in Shanghai's water supply. It's springtime. Uh, the bears are stirring from their hibernation, and the great energy of new life is on the move. Uh, tonight's show certainly paints that picture. This is a lodge tonight, and I'm holding sacred space. We are not apologists here tonight. We speak with the confidence of knowing that our consciousness is alive and functioning and flowering. There are lots of bears on the move now. I'm a bear. Graham Hancock's a bear. Joe Rogan is a bear. Greg Braden is a bear. Robert Hastings is a bear. Derek Jensen and Charles Eisenstein are bears. There are many of us, male and female, who are moving into action synchronously now, and I believe Graham will agree that that he's aware of, of that movement. But there's a, there's a stunning power where it's, it's a massive shift in consciousness that I believe is very, very real. The hundredth monkey is here. So there are three authors in my life. And when I picked up their books, I, I had a, 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 a symbiotic, a physical, an emotional, a spiritual, and energetic reaction to them. The first uh, was in the early 1980s uh, when I entered 12-step recovery. Did 21 years there. 
uh, and I picked up the books of Edgar Casey. I, 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 I cannot tell you how these books possess me. I read five or six. Then I read some books by Graham Hancock. In particular, uh, uh, almost a decade later, I read The Sign and the Seal, and I read Fingerprints of the Gods. And, I, and Fingerprints of the Gods is one of two books that I used uh, upon which to model my book, Crossing the Rubicon. Uh, I, I looked at the work Graham Hancock and, and had done in that book, and I said, holy shit. Um, if if he can do this, this is the way it's done. And the other book which I used uh, was a book by Gerard Colby and Charlotte Bennett uh, called Thy Will Be Done, Nelson Rockefeller and the Conquest of the Amazon. I love the synchronicity here. Graham Hancock sold uh, uh, between, I believe, five and six million books. He's written, I don't know, 2,000 books. He's written like 20 or 30 books. He's world famous, and if you don't know who he is, look him up. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but it is a distinct honor for me tonight to say my first words to him, having been a fan and been inspired by him for so long, who was born exactly six months almost to the day before I was. Um, uh, be, because there are times when two pieces of light can connect, and the light gets many, many times brighter. So as I welcome Graham Hancock to the show tonight, let me just say this, that uh, this is a sacred space that I hold here. We do not apologize. Graham knows as well as I do the pains of having to footnote everything and, and to defend that because of the really, really bad uh, ways in which we have been brutally attacked uh, over the years for our work. Um, he's free to talk about that, but I know that we have shared that experience, but this is a place where we know we are winning, and that's the way we talk, and that's the way we're going to approach the, this show tonight, and uh, I feel like I've talked too long already. Graham Hancock, welcome uh, welcome to our lodge. Welcome uh, to join all of us on the Lifeboat Hour in a, a new consciousness. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's good to be amongst friends. I appreciate that introduction, and I appreciate this connection with you. Oh, absolutely, sir. We've got a lot of work to do tonight. So before I, I'm going to ask you to speak for yourself here, because I believe we can save time before we get to other really important issues. For those of you who don't know what TED is, here's what Wikipedia has to say. TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. It's a global set of conferences only owned by the private nonprofit Sapling Foundation, formed to disseminate, quote, ideas worth spreading. Founded in 84. They've done, you know, everything. And, and uh, the, the Bill Clinton, oh, yeah, okay, Al Gore, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Gates, uh, a, a, a lot of people whose names are anathema to me. Uh, but And I have never uh, had great respect for their work, having seen much of my work uh, turn up in other presentations there. Uh, but when Ted had Graham on, it, it became the presentation which I played on the show last week. Uh, and I'm assuming, for the sake of discussion, that everybody is familiar with that, that brilliant piece of oration that so sums up where we are right now. So that's who Ted is. Now, with that, Graham, uh, in your own words, because that will save time, can you take us briefly through how the Ted thing came about, how it went, uh, and what's happened since? I'll, I'll let you tell that story. Sure, sure, ab absolutely. It's been uh, it's been an extraordinary and strange experience uh, altogether. Um, you know, because I've been on the outside and on the margins of things for for very many years, and Ted is kind of. Although they, although they say that they're in the business of um, transmitting challenging ideas, they're kind of mainstream and central. So I was very surprised to get an invitation to speak at a TED conference. Now, to be clear, this was what is called a TEDx conference. That's, you know, there's the main TED conference, which is one thing, and then there's TEDx conferences. I'm going to use their language, which take the TED brand. They speak of themselves as a brand, you know, like a can of beans mm -hmm. or a motor car, mm -hmm. um, which take the TED brand, but they're independently organized conferences which occur all over the world. And a group of good-hearted, open-minded students in London got together and decided to create a conference that was going to challenge existing paradigms, which they felt was very much within the ethos of TED as uh, spreading new and challenging ideas. Mm -hmm. 
And they invited me to be one of the speakers at that conference. Uh, and amongst others, they invited uh, my friend Rupert Sheldrake mm-hmm. to be a speaker at that conference. Rupert Sheldrake is a scientist, but he's been very critical of, sci- of, of some mainstream science, and he's done excellent work on what are regarded by mainstream scientists as fringe topics such as telepathy, uh, such as the sense of being stared at. He's written a book about dogs who know when their owners are coming home before their owners even know when they're coming home. This kind of thing. So interesting science that he's done. So he was another one of the speakers. And when I saw that Rupert was going to be there, I thought, well, great, this is going to be a very interesting event. And I decided that I was happy to speak at it. And it was, it was a significant challenge because I was required to present a talk. My subject was going to be consciousness, which is a subject that I've been deeply interested involved with for, for many, many years, and I was required to present a talk in 18 minutes, and I took this, eight, you know, it's much easier to talk for an hour than it is to talk for 18 minutes. Oh, indeed. I've had that experience many times. You really have to focus. You've really got to focus, and there's, you know, you've got to be sure you don't make missteps because you don't have time to go back and correct your errors. It's a very, very fast-moving situation, and I, I conscientiously, for, actually for a month, uh, worked up and developed this talk called The War on Consciousness, because I do believe that that is what is going on in our society today. Our society values only one specific kind of consciousness, which is, which is what I call the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. And our society allows us little holidays from that state of consciousness with alcohol and tobacco and coffee and sugar um, and, you know, uh, one or two other pharmacological drugs that are approved. Yes. But, but otherwise, we're not allowed to explore any other states of consciousness. And in fact, our society will send us to prison if we exercise our sovereign right as adults to explore the mysteries of our own consciousness by using, for example, psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I mean, what an unbelievable transgression on adult sovereignty it is for a government to tell us that we may not have certain experiences in the privacy of our own homes, in the inner sanctum of our own consciousness. And I always say, you know, let's get this clear, guys. If we are not allowed to be sovereign over our own consciousness, then we're not sovereign over anything. No. And we do not. We do not have any meaningful freedom. So this is quite a radical message that Ted were inviting me to come on board and speak about. Yeah. Now, now let let me just do a little sidebar here, and 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 say that the uh, the uh, the uh, kernel or or, the, or or the grain of sand in the pearl of your speech was Mother Ayahuasca, and yes. I will say for the record, which I have said it again, but I will say that I I, I maintain the public position that I have done one journey with a, a substance called 5-MeO-DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is yeah. the root drug uh, of, uh, of Mother Ayahuasca, um, you know, a, a, a God-given, spirit-given uh, psychedelic substance. Uh, and so has my friend Joe Rogan, and I, I know that you have been a guest on Joe's show, and, and we, in a sense, if you will, follow not only from the traditions of uh, many shamans going back, uh, and grandfathers, many, many tens of thousands of years, but also in, in the footsteps of people like Terence McKenna uh, mm-hmm. and 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 others. I wanted to put that out just for uh, yes, uh, and and, and I'll, I'll pick you up on that sidebar, and 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 I will say that uh, ayahuasca, um, which is uh, an indigenous vision, visionary brew of the Amazon jungle, which has been in use for thousands of years uh, in the Amazon, um, has become a very important part of my life. I have just this year completed my 50th journey with ayahuasca. Mm. Um, I've had 11 journeys with DMT, uh, smoked DMT Mm -hmm. as well. DMT is the active ingredient of ayahuasca, but DMT is not 
normally accessible orally. Mm. We normally have to smoke it because there's an enzyme in our stomachs called monoamine oxidase that switches off DMT on contact. But in the Amazon, those clever shamans of the Amazon have got round this problem. They've created a, 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 an orally active form of DMT by mixing together two plants, one of which contains DMT and the other which contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It's quite advanced chemistry, actually, that they're doing down there in the Amazon. And the result is a highly psychoactive oral brew that produces a journey that lasts for about four hours, whereas, as you know, smoked DMT is a much shorter journey. Yeah, my, my, my five MEO journey was two hours as opposed to a standard uh, DMT journey. And I should add, like and you... And a standard DMT journey, because 5-MEO DMT and NNDMT are, are somewhat different things. Uh, a standard DMT journey, smoked DMT, is 12 to 15 minutes. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I want to so, emphasize. So, so we're dealing with we're dealing what we're dealing with with DMT is a substance which is you know evokes gasps of horror from the thought police in our society uh, uh, all around the world uh, and which is a Schedule One drug and which is highly illegal. But here it is, the active ingredient of an ancient and sacred brew, which shamans of the Amazon believe brings us into contact with other realms and other intelligences and other entities that they call the spirit world and I uh, in initially because I wanted to research this subject for, for a book that I wrote some years ago a book called Supernatural I had to go down to the Amazon and experience uh, this extraordinary brew and what's happened since I had those experiences for research is that I found it's had such a transformatory effect on my life and has made me to re made me rethink many of my fundamental ideas about the nature of reality that I've continued to work with ayahuasca and I have five or six ayahuasca journeys uh, every year. I have had an observation, Graham, uh, as a result of this, and, and we'll get back to the TED story. I'm sure most are, are, are familiar with it, that not only your presentation, but uh, Rupert Sheldrake's and several others, and I, and I find some amazing uh, threads of consistency between all those presentations, uh, have been systematically uh, taken away from TED. Well, well look, can I, can I just speak on that? Because, sure. Okay, TEDx did the conference. I spoke at the conference. My, my, my talk was put out up on the TEDx YouTube channel, okay, and it ran there for three weeks, and during those three weeks, it gathered 132,000 views, <laughs> and the talk was uh, clearly popular, uh, it was controversial, there was a lot of discussion around it, which is very healthy. Three mm -hmm. individuals were choosing to go and listen to that talk and make up their own minds about it, and some people liked it, and some people hated it, and they were debating in the comments, and that is exactly what should happen in a free and open society. And then TED, the organization, the big brand, which is funded by huge pharmaceutical companies and Xerox and all sorts of people like that, then TED suddenly stepped up and said, we are not going to allow people to see this talk anymore. We are going to take it offline. We are going to take it off the TED YouTube channel because, quote, unquote, it is not scientific. And they did the same on the same day with Rupert Sheldrake's talk. Yes. And what a patronizing, what a patronizing attitude to to the adult population of the world that adults are not capable of making up their own minds about the merits of the of a talk. Ted must take that decision for them and just actually take the talk out of circulation whatsoever. And I must say, uh, this made me uh, extremely annoyed. Well, and it is, and it is, I, I think, an insult to the intelligence of of reasonable thoughtful adults everywhere that TED have behaved in this way and I think it's actually a significant issue in our society today that that we have a kind of thought police operating which seeks to con it's it's ironic that my talk was called the war on consciousness yes because actually what it's about is a thought police that seeks to control our consciousness mind control in our society and I've now seen that applied directly to my own talk by TED taking it offline I have uh, I'm holding in my hand, Graham Hancock, right now, a book called The Master Game, 
written yes. by yourself and Mr. Robert Boval, uh, which, uh, which led me to some amazing insights. Uh, uh, and one of which was, as I have looked back, I've, of course, I've, I've been on a spiritual path for 30-some years, and I've studied a great many criminal activities and persecutions. But one of the things that I find in common, especially from th- th- this book, was I saw a common theme behind all of the persecutions, the genocides, the enslavements, the, the infection, the, the, the destruction, systematic mm. as, as applied by the Catholic Church, as applied by uh, human industrial civilization, which mm. is that anything that had an earth-based philosophy was targeted, and that would include even Gnostic Christi- Christians, Absolutely, Hermetic yeah. Christians. And what I see here is a parallel in this information that is being uh, trying to be excised from TED, there is a consistency, and I've been a warrior my whole life. You know, I've been out here spitting in their faces for a long time. And mm. and what I see here is a consistent theme. And w- what I'm sensing is, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing the beast howl. I think a nerve has been struck. Do you feel that? I totally think a nerve has been struck. Um, it, it, it's abs- absolutely the case. A, ner- a nerve has been struck, uh, and that and that nerve is the arrogant notion of relatively small groups of people that they have the right to control our thinking. Yes. And clearly, my presentation on TED uh, was challenging uh, to that idea of theirs. And rather than debate me. They just decided to take me offline. But you know, they'd forgotten something. Mm -hmm. They'd forgotten that now today is not the 1980s or even the early 1990s. Now today we have the internet. We have an instrument for the free expression of views. And all around the world, millions and billions of people are refusing to wear that chain around their yes. neck anymore yes. and are refusing to be told what to think. And I've been heartened and encouraged and my heart has been warmed by the fantastic response that the global community on the Internet and that my social network community on my, on my, on my Facebook pages has, has given to me to, to, to turn against Ted and tell them we are not going to put up with that shit anymore. Ted, we are not going to put up with it. We are free individuals, and we are going to think what we want to think, and you will not tell us what to think. And I've been so encouraged by that. And I think that, you know, this is one sign amongst many that the horrendous system of control that has suppressed the human spirit for so long and that has operated so powerfully in our societies is just falling apart, breaking apart, and that something new and wonderful is being birthed. And I think we should all feel grateful to be part of the birth pangs yes. of of a new tomorrow. Speaking from a spiritual standpoint, I just had a minor vision in my head, a, a, a vision in my head of George Orwell and Terence McKenna dancing an Irish jig together, twirling <laughs> each other around. Uh, yes, yes, there, yes, there is an awakening underway, and this goes back to, to the theme that I'm painting. Now, as, as I look through the, the systematic persecution, murder, annihilation, torture, rape, all these words need to be said. We have to bear witness to this. Of all of the ancestors for the last last five or six thousand years since a God Jehovah separated us from everything else, mm. whether you call yourself Lakota or Hopi or Bushman or Buddhist or Hindu or, uh, or any, uh, Druid or Pagan or Wiccan, whether you, whatever you call yourself, understanding the interconnectedness of all things, we are all Gaian now. Yes. And I believe that Gaian consciousness is alive and well, especially in this lodge that, that we're holding tonight. And I feel that very strongly, and I'm sensing that you do too, that we're in motion now, that things are... I feel it, I feel it very strongly, and this yeah. is part of the mystery of, uh, of ayahuasca, and it's part of what Ted didn't like about my talk, because <laughs> I talked a lot about ayahuasca in that, in, in, in that talk. And I was <laughs> careful in what I said to, to make clear that I'm not claiming any reality status for these visions. I myself believe that the visions are highly meaningful and real, but I don't claim or insist that others must believe that. I'm simply, I'm simply reporting what people experience all around the world. And it's a very curious thing as the Amazon jungle, that sacred realm, that unique source of biodiversity, the lungs of our planet, that, that beautiful 
garden of the Amazon jungle, as it comes under increasing threat, as it faces the most horrific destruction from the global industrial complex, as whole country-sized areas of the Amazon are slashed down and turned into soya bean farms to feed cattle to fuel the hamburger industry. As all of this is happening, as this suicidal attack on the Amazon is taking place, out of the Amazon has emerged this ancient and sacred ceremony associated with a vine and a leaf. And this is the ceremony of ayahuasca. And in the ayahuasca visionary state, which can go very, very deep, people all around the world who've not been in contact with one another, who've not compared notes, are mm -hmm. reporting encounters with an intelligent entity yes. who, who they construe as a goddess. And more and more often, we call her Mother Ayahuasca. And although she is not powerful in the physical realm, she operates in the realm of consciousness, and she believes that she can bring about change in the world through affecting and altering human consciousness. And now, suddenly today, after thousands of years of being confined within the Amazon, just at the moment when the Amazon is under greatest threat, you can find ayahuasca ceremony available in New York, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. in Toronto, mm -hmm. in Tokyo, in mm -hmm. London, in Cairo, anywhere you go in the world, even in the Arabian Gulf, you can in 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 in, in the countries of the Gulf, the, the Arab countries of the Gulf, like like uh, D D D D Dubai or, or Qatar, you can find ayahuasca ceremonies available. Stunning all around the world, this, this vine has traveled out of the Amazon and has presented itself globally in human culture and is having an impact on human consciousness. And, you know, this, this way that she's seen as a, as a goddess, as the mother goddess of the planet, ties in exactly with what you're saying about, about Gaia. Um, and, and, and that is what many of us who've drunk ayahuasca are coming to feel that we're dealing with here. Yes. And, and, you know, she's an extraordinary encounter. And I understand that people who've, who have not experienced ayahuasca must feel very skeptical about what I'm saying. And all I would say to those people is, hold on a while. Mm -hmm. Go drink ayahuasca in the right setting, in the responsible sh setting with, with shamanic guidance. Yes. And that is available in the West as, as well as in the, in the Amazon jungle. Go, go drink ayahuasca. Have that experience. Hold your judgment until you've had that experience because it is extraordinary and it is transformatory and it will work on you and on your own life and make you think about the harm and damage that you do to others and it will work on your consciousness in relation to the planet as a whole. Indeed, and, 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 and this is a perfect setup where at the bottom of the hour I'm skipping a station break tonight, Graham. I don't know, don't know if you've heard the Thank Lifeboat you. Hour before, but it is a part of our lodge ceremony, our, our tradition here, that we always mix music in with, and as you know from having attended many ceremonies, that the music and the drama yeah. is extremely important. Music and this is, is important. This is a part of our ritual here, and I have picked tonight a very, very special song, and I wish that I could see Graham Hancock's face when he hears uh, what I'm going to play tonight. I am playing this in his honor and in my honor, but also in the honor of all of the people that I know that Graham Hancock and I recognize who held the space open for us to appear and make our contributions at this critical moment. Uh, but it is time and our time has come. And so I chose tonight a song uh, from a group called Florence and the Machine. The song is called Spectrum. And I know you who have followed me for a long time are going to crack up when, when, when you hear the catch line in the song. Uh, but let this song into your heart and let this song work on your spirit as you listen to the rest of this show tonight. Here it is. Let's go. Well, there's a little inspiration for everybody. That was Florence and the Machine. The song is called Spectrum in the Hook Line, in case you didn't hear, was Say, say My Name. Uh, her name is Gaia. Mm -hmm. Her name Absolutely. is Gaia. Say her name. Uh, let us strike those notes. Uh, let us become harmonies 
Let us, let, us, come. let us remember the sacred beauty of this planet that we've been gifted, the incredible opportunity to be born in a human body, to be able to make these fine distinctions between light and darkness, to learn and to grow and to develop in this garden of experience. What an opportunity we've been given and how wicked and wrong it is of government and state forces and nameless bureaucracies to alienate us from our true destiny as spirits in growth in this garden. There is, uh, for those of you out there listening tonight to the Lifeboat Hour, you're all involved in this, and there is some amazing prayer being let loose tonight, and oh, let's uh, let's go for it. This is Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth. We're on for the second half of the Lifeboat Hour here on the Progressive Radio Network. Uh, my amazingly special guest and, and instant, instant old friend, uh, Graham Hancock, is joining us tonight. We're talking about a whole lot of things that are going on. I think most importantly, something we've already concluded together, which is that a shift in consciousness is underway, and and uh, ipso facto, the, the fact that we are having this show and this discussion is proof of it. Uh, okay, so Graham, let, let's go back and let me throw something else into the mix for your discussion before I turn it back to you. Joe Rogan uh, recently posted a, a, an interview with Eddie Wong, who had been a, mm. a, a TED presenter. Who and mm. <laughs> we we've both been on Joe's show, and I think we both think uh, think very highly of Joe. Joe's uh, a fantastic, fantastic guy. I, 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 I love Joe. He's a wonderful man, and, and, and his show is really a tremendous instrument of raising consciousness in the world today. So what I see happening now is, uh, speaking for myself, but I, I, I can feel you nodding your head already. I, I, you know, I, I started as an investigative journalist more than 30 years ago, and you're right. We no longer face the same obstacles of consciousness that we used to have to deal with that were so nauseating, so mundane, so heavy, so pedantic. Um, um, that's well, the big is- powers in those days could just shut down the individual in a second yes. by their control of the mass media. Yes, uh, They could just absolutely decide what messages reached the public and what messages did not reach the public. And this is why the Internet is such a beautiful thing and mm-hmm. such an amazing instrument for liberation despite all its problems because the truth can no longer be hidden away in a dark corner. The internet and the power of the human spirit and the the drive that that so many, many people have now for truth, for for, for truth to be brought out uh, is served by the internet uh, in in an incredible way. One of the things... And if I can just say, I mean, this has been brought home to me by the fantastic heartwarming uh, reaction uh, that I have received following the censorship of my presentation by Ted and the incredible support and I'm just so grateful to that for that support and I want to put it on on record to my social network communities on 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 Facebook uh, and to the internet community around the world who've come who've come to my rescue and, and my support and spoken out against what Ted did and, and just on that theme I want to add Please, I have uh, put up, because this is a very quick conversation about a very long and deep issue, sure. I have put up all the links that will be useful to people who want to research this matter further on the first page, the opening page of my website, and that Which is, is simply www.grahamhancock.com, G-R-A-H-A-M-H-A-N-C-O-C-K.com. On the very first page, all the relevant links are there, and people who want to explore this further who perhaps aren't familiar with what we're talking about tonight will find the background information through those links. Great. When, when, when you speak of the power of the Internet, and yes, there is something alive and beautiful happening here, I, am, I was struck immediately by a number of links where, where new research in particle physics uh, and, and quantum me- mechanics uh, is absolutely, uh, <laughs> to use a word that David Wilcock uses, is totally coherent uh, with mm. sh- shamanic teachings and, sh- and science and shamanism are approaching. And I refer yes. specifically not only to uh, the work of David Wilcock, whose, whose, whose book, Source Field Investigations, was another pivotal turning point in my life last year. But yeah, and I wrote an introduction for that excellent book. Uh, okay. And, uh, but also specifically the work of Greg Braden, who was an amazing inspiration. And I think you've made uh, some video presentations with Greg, have you not? I met Greg only once, as a matter of fact, and that was way back in the day in like 1997. A lovely man, very much enjoyed meeting him, not had the privilege to meet him again.
again uh, mm-hmm. since then, but I, I do highly value you and respect his work. And, and what he has done with, like you have in your work and I have in my work with Crossing the Rubicon, is he has compiled enormous amounts of peer-reviewed, overwhelming science that tells us, essentially, that consciousness, that frequency, determines our physical reality. And exactly. This is, exactly. This, this, and this is the is ayahuasca what, this, message, right? This is the ayahuasca message, and this is what the powers that be detest. Yes. And this is why my TED talk was taken offline. Uh, because, because what I'm fundamentally challenging is is a deeply rooted assumption within the power structures of our society about the nature of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Most mainstream scientists, not all, but most mainstream scientists, and they exert a stranglehold over the public thought about what is real and what is not real, take the view that consciousness is simply generated by the brain, that consciousness can be reduced to matter, that it is, in their language, an epiphenomenon of brain activity, that it's a kind of accident for all the survival things that the brain does. We get this little extra bonus called consciousness and they don't and and therefore those who hold that view cannot possibly believe for example in life after death they can't believe in the conscious in the survival of death by consciousness because they see consciousness simply as a product of physical activities and they don't consider the possibility of another analogy and I made this analogy in my talk Mm -hmm. that the relationship of consciousness to the brain may actually be more more like the relationship of a TV signal to a TV set. And in that case, when you destroy the TV set, the TV signal is still there. Yes. And I actually believe that consciousness is the fundamental property of the universe, as fundamental, more fundamental than, than uh, gravity or the speed of light or electricity, that consciousness is really what it's all about. And consciousness is manifesting in physical form on this plane, on our planet Earth, but it is not limited to that form. Here is another amazing synchronicity. Crazy Horse, uh, the Lakota chief uh, who was legendary, he was never photographed, and he had amazing magic. He had amazing uh, amazing power. Crazy Mm -hmm. Horse said that he spent more time in the spirit world through vision quests, through fasting, through through his means. He spent more time there than in this physical world because he said that was the real world and this is not. And how how absolutely right he is, in my opinion. How absolutely right he is. Look, we have these physical bodies. We have a physical job to do here on Earth. It is part of what we are. We can't deny that. We should celebrate the joy of our physical reality. But if we get lured into the illusion that that's all there is and that that's all that we're here for, if we get so deeply attached to that physical reality that we forget our real mission here, which is to grow and develop our spirit, our soul, then we are lost because actually this physical world is the illusory world. Mm -hmm. Everything about it is temporary. Everything is in change. Everything is in flux. Nothing lasts. Nothing endures. There is a realm beyond this realm, which is real, and which we, while we're locked in our physical bodies, can only encounter in altered states of consciousness, trance states, visionary states. It's in those visionary states that we get a glimpse of the eternal reality beyond this temporary and limited reality that we call uh, physical life. So Crazy Horse was was absolutely right. That is the real world, and that's so, ultimately what we need to focus our attention on. Because when we die, that's where our destiny is. That's what we're going to. That's what we're living our lives to step out into. That's the next great adventure, and we need to be prepared for it. And there are so many structures in our society which are denying us that opportunity to prepare, and which are forcing us to concentrate on trivial and meaningless. Pursuits. So let us now weave another colored thread into this beautiful tapestry that we're creating on, in, uh, in our lodge tonight. 
which would be also the synchronicities that appear with Mayan and Hopi prophecies and many, many other indigenous prophecies. I'm sure we could talk about those for hours, not not just Native American, but ancient prophecies that uh, spoke to the changing of an age, the procession of equinoxes, mm-hmm. to the ending of a 5,300-year cycle, and to a period in time which all of the ancient prophecies, I believe, share in common, which is that we are evolving now into a golden age when, Mm. uh, to paraphrase, our consciousness, the loving consciousness, will begin to manifest more directly and more quickly as physical reality. Now, how did I do Mm. with that? Very good, very good, and that's, and that's absolutely spot on, and that's exactly what we're in right now. And let's not forget the tremendous powers, dark forces that have been operating throughout human history are ranged against this birth uh, and are seeking to prevent it coming about. But it will come about. All that is necessary is for all of us, everyone, every individual, to exert absolutely our right to sovereignty over our own consciousness and to resist the control of those dark forces, those archons, as the Gnostics uh, used to used to call them. And yes, you're right to draw attention to the Mayan and the Hopi uh, prophecies. And of course, they received so much ridicule from the from the mainstream when 21st of December 2012 passed. And hey, guess what? The world didn't end because the Mayan prophecies never said the world was exactly. going to end on the 21st of December 2012. They said what was going to happen then was the end of an epoch and the beginning of a new epoch, the very beginning of a new epoch, and we're at that cusp moment right now, and it's very interesting that the the, the long count calendar, the 13 back tunes of the long count calendar, ran for 5,126 years to 2012, and that's from from 5,000 years ago until 2012, and those 5,000 years are exactly the period of the hegemony of the big state, the big government, the big corporation, the big centralized religion, all the things that have created the harmful conditions that confront us in the world today, and all of those things are breaking down. They're falling apart. They don't work anymore. The model is broken. The Maya were right. That era has come to an end, and a new era is being birthed, and it's our responsibility as sovereign, independent, intelligent, free-thinking adults to make sure that that new era is filled with light and beauty, and that we throw off the control of these powers and these institutions that have sought for so long to force us to think in their way. Our thinking is ours alone to decide. The uh, dialectic that uh, that is driving this rapid awakening of consciousness, I would liken to a sharp knife uh, cutting through uh, fabric, um, yeah. is is that as this, as situations out in the world get con- progressively worse, more insane, uh, you know, more uh, Bosch like uh, in, in 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 the concept of hell, as as those events start to come, people's consciousness is now are more available. And I think that that's part of the edge that we have to carry as warriors, if you will, and is that we also have to bear witness to and watch the horrible things that are happening in the world outside. Yeah. And, and in fact, this raises a very interesting point in my mind, which concerns the United States of America. Mm. Because there are two issues going on here. At one level, on the global stage, uh, I don't mean to cause offense, but the United States of America is a profoundly negative and deadly influence. Yes. But at another level, at the level of grassroots, at the level of the citizens and people of the United States, an amazing and beautiful thing is happening, which is not, and I feel emotional when I say this, because, yes. because it's not happening anywhere else in the world. There is an incredible awakening taking place in the United States, an incredible movement of the people to take power over themselves and to throw off these ghastly, horrific, con- controlling structures that have been misleading us for, for so long. 
And it's fascinating to me that, 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 that in the very country which at the corporate and bureaucratic and state level has been connected with so much harm and damage, there is this flowering, beautiful awakening of consciousness and spirit in America. And I see it everywhere, and I see it more strongly in America than I see it anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's an amazing thing, and it's why I love to come to America and, and, and just, just see this beauty that's, that's all around me and that, that, the incredible intelligence and, and awareness and state of awakening of just ordinary people in their everyday lives who are refusing any longer to accept the bullshit that's been poured out at them for so long. And it's a, and it's a wonderful thing. So I see in the United States uh, the, really the hope for, for the future, not from the state, not from the government, not from the big bureaucracies, but from the people at the grassroots level. Fantastic things are happening. And, and, and here I think it is entirely appropriate to express gratitude in this lodge to all of the first peoples of Turtle Island, to all of the indigenous peoples who have, through some of the most horrendous persecutions, genocide, you name it, uh, uh, that have been applied, uh, to all of the Native American peoples who have held these traditions alive and who are now stepping forward, just like the uh, ayahuasca elders uh, and the elders from South America who have held this knowledge for us and who are stepping forward abundantly to feed us with their teachings and the things that they have held so sacred for so long. Absolutely, absolutely. And to quote the late, great, wonderful Terence McKenna, another, wow. another, another great American, that these people have kept the flame of a tremendous mystery burning when the rest of the world wanted to snuff it out. Yes. And thanks to them, the flame of that mystery is still alive, and we may warm our hands at it and learn and grow from it. You know, what shamans in the Amazon told me when I asked them to analyze the sickness of the West, the sickness of the great industrial and technological powers, they said it's quite simple. You've severed your connection with spirit. If you don't reconnect with spirit, and if you don't do it soon, you're going to bring the whole house of cards tumbling down around your heads and ours. And they see it as their mission uh, to help us to reconnect with spirit and to do so urgently and to do so soon. And I think there's a readiness and, and a willingness to accept that, not spirit as it is preached in the big hierarchical no. religions, no. but the free and independent re-emergence of spirit that all of us feel flowering within ourselves today. Which brings us now, we've got about nine minutes left, to uh, another theme I'd like to introduce here, which just struck by that as, uh, as you were talking. We also talk about prophecies, and there is a prophecy uh, called the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. Uh, which had its origins, we believe, in uh, in uh, South America, but it is extremely well known throughout the Western Hemisphere, which is that, if you will, on the one hand, the condor of South America and the eagle of North America will fly mm-hmm. wingtip to wingtip and be reunited. But on another hand, it means uh, that the heart, which has been brutally suppressed and subjugated to Cartesian tyranny uh, mm-hmm. will find its liberation uh, being a more powerful and uh, organ, but also that the male and the female will be balanced again. And I am mm-hmm. very aware that this prophecy of the eagle and the condor is being fulfilled as we speak. Indeed, perhaps, Graham, you and I and many others are part of the fulfillment of that prophecy, but it all mm-hmm. speaks ultimately to healing, to healing. Healing and restoration and it, of the, and it speaks, if I may say, to the spirit of the divine feminine. Yes, this this is what's been this is what's been, been so missing from 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 the world. You know, yeah. we've we've had we've had too much of this catas- catastrophic, c- controlling, egocentered male energy, and and what is this is the other thing that's coming dramatically alive is the spirit of the divine feminine. I don't think it's an accident that the spirit of ayahuasca uh, manifests and presents herself to people all over the world as as a female entity. Mm -hmm. Uh, powerfully, strongly female, with love and nurturing, but also with strength. 
real strength and um this is this is what we need to to reach out for and 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 grasp now a harmony of male and female energies which, if we're going to move forward into a new and better world which speaks to uh the canadian movement idle no more uh, an indigenous movement in Canada standing up to the Harper uh, government's brutal rape of all their environmental laws and indigenous rights. And it, it is, yeah. it, it is a matrilineal, uh, it is a female, a woman led movement. And they are being also extremely effective in Canada and, and brutally ignored also by the mainstream media, which seems to be losing its grip. And I just felt that we don't to need that. the mainstream media anymore. No, the we don't. The mainstream media, they've had their day. They're still trumpeting and crowing, but they're over, they're done with. We have a new kind of media today where people talk to people directly, where we have communities of like-minded individuals gathering and coalescing all around the world, mm -hmm. where we no longer need to adhere to the notion of nation or patriotism, but where we associate with one another simply as fellow human beings with shared ideas and shared thoughts and shared hopes and shared longings. And this is the, the way forward to the future, in my view. I think we are already in the future. Somebody posted on Facebook, Mike, is this the beginning of the end? And I stole from Winston Churchill, but I yeah. said it may be the end of the beginning. Uh, exactly. I, I, I believe we're moving into that. So, Gr Graham Hancock, uh, we have six minutes left. Well, can, I just, can I just say again, because of a long and complex conversation, all the links that are relevant to this conversation, just look at the first page of my website, www.grahamhancock.com, and you'll find all the links there which will lead to deeper inquiry into the subjects we've been talking about. What is on your immediate agenda for the near future, Graham? Well, you know, I've been, I've been called, um, this is another curious thing from my work with ayahuasca, I've been known for writing non-fiction for many, many years, and I've written many books about historical mysteries, but for the last four years or so, as a result of a series of visions that I had in, in Brazil, I've been writing novels, you know, and I've written a novel called uh, Entangled, which is a time travel novel about a battle of good against evil, uh, one young woman 24,000 years ago, one young woman today, brought together by supernatural forces to do battle with a demon who travels through time, and I've just finished a, another novel called War God, about the Spanish conquest of Mexico, which was a turning point point in human history and which truly was the beginning of the darkness that we're now struggling to uh, to escape from so i felt i felt called to i'm 62 years old now and and i felt that i needed to make a change of direction and to explore my creativity in other directions but that being said <laughs> uh, something else has happened as well uh, which is that, uh, that I think the book for which I'm best known is Fingerprints of the Gods, yes. which which looks at the possibility of a lost civilization of a great forgotten episode in human yes. history more than 12,000 years ago. And my goodness, I came in for the most unbelievable amount of ridicule and criticism and attack from mainstream science and archaeology for even considering that possibility back in 1995. Yes. But now... You know, in 2013, so much new evidence has come out to support that yes. possibility that I've decided to write a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods, and I've been researching it already for some time, and I'm going to publish that sequel in 2015, and it's going to be called Magicians of the Gods, and I'm working actively on that project right now and for the next year and a half. And what I'm working on now, I, I think you'll find this of interest, is a project which I cannot discuss yet. It's in Los Angeles. Angeles, but it's 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 getting closer. It essentially, mm. which is based around the concept that between the works of people like yourself, uh, forbidden archaeology, all of the work that's out there, it is possible mm. to assemble. Uh, mm -hmm. if you will, as a detective putting together a mosaic, a picture mm -hmm. of reality and where we're going that is enormously coherent and makes mm -hmm. sense as we try to match the world that we live in with the mm -hmm. press releases that we receive mm -hmm. about what's going on out there. Absolutely. Uh, um, so, aside... Good luck with that. It sounds, it sounds exciting. Well, sounds like you... it needs to be done. I expect you're going to be hearing from me, and, and so will people like Greg Braden. Who, uh, of, of all the other people out there, who has inspired you? 
Uh, who has who opened doors of consciousness for you in, in terms of writers, authors, teachers, any, anybody that's out there now or in the past? Out there now or in the or in the past? I have to I have to say that that uh, amongst the, the greatest inspirations for me have been Aldous Huxley, mm. George Orwell. Mm-hmm. And Terence McKenna. <laughs> Come on. I mean, let's pay tribute to, to that great man who died, who died too soon. Oh. Ter- Terence McKenna was a, was a wonderful gift from the universe to humanity. When I, when voice, I lived... The way he spoke, electrifying, electrifying. He could summarize in a, in a pithy, short phrase. He could mm. summarize incredible depth and just spark awakening in people. What a gift he had, and thank goodness his voice is still heard all over the internet, even though he's, he's, long, he's long God. And his brother Dennis, Dennis McKenna, another wonderful individual who I've been privileged to get to know uh, very well over the last year. And Dennis has written a book, The Brotherhood of the Street, Screaming Abyss, about his relationship as a brother to Terence McKenna. And, and I would urge anybody listening to go out and pick up that book by Dennis McKenna. It's very, we are, very, very good. Uh, we are sadly out of time. When I was living in Sebastopol, California, I was living four miles from Terence McKenna's house, and the people who were heirs to what he was teaching there in Northern California were the ones who took me on my DMT journey, and I love the synchronicity right. of all of this. Uh, Gr- Graham Hancock, who I consider to be uh, carrying the baton left by people like Terence McKenna, it's been an amazing treat to have you on the show tonight. I am very much honored. I do not think it will be the last time that we have to more. more. We have a lot of work to do, my brother. I also call you my uncle. I thank you for all you've done, Graham Hancock. Thank you. Thank you. So good to talk to you. We'll have you back soon. Excellent. All right, Bye-bye. everybody. All right. Good night. Bye. 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 All right. So this is Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth. Uh, dudes, I'll be back with you next week with another Lifeboat Hour. It is springtime. The bears are on the move. Two weeks from tonight, Charles Eisenstein. Until then, keep your minds open. I'll see you then. Bye.